Hello, my friends, and welcome to the fire pit of the heart of the forest, at the time between times. The time, it's neither night nor day, but the sun has gone, and the sky is grey. It's the time when the veil between our world and the fairy world grows wafer, wafer thin. So thin that for, a, for this moment, in just a few moments, we can reach into the other world. And for a few moments, they can reach into ours. But here I am, as the fire crackles. Far away, I can hear the rain pounding down like thunder. But tonight, I am not alone. And that makes the fire pit even better. For I am with my good friend, Dr. Dereth Bader, folklorist and author of the brand new book, The Folklore of Wales, Ghosts, along with Mark Norman. Delith, it's so good to have you here tonight. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Every time I come here, I sit at the fire pit and I think of stories and I think of tales and I think of myths and legends and all the lovely things that have happened in Wales. But I have to say that when I read your book and I was lucky enough to have a copy a few weeks ago, there is so much in here that even I, and I don't think, apart from you, there is anyone who has read more Welsh ghost stories than me. But there's so much that I've learned in this book. There are so many things that just became far more clear to me now when I was reading it. The rules for ghosts in Wales. The way that ghosts appear to people. The way that ghosts sometimes will only speak to one person. The way a ghost will only speak when spoken to. All these things which, although I've read it in many stories did not materialise until I read this book and it all makes sense. It's a brilliant tome, Delith, and I'm so proud that a friend of mine has written this. You must be chuffed to bits with it. Oh, thank you. That's so nice of you to say. Yeah, I, I am. I'm really, really proud of the book. It's been a sort of, it's been a long process and actually the book itself has been a long time coming. It's been a life's dream of mine to sort of write a book about the ghost lore of Wales um, so I'm really, really happy with the way it's turned out. Oh, and so you should be. And just to start off, um, Delith, you're someone who has a feet, has a foot in many worlds. You are a doctor, pathologist, scientist, should I say, but also into folklore, into myths, into legends. Now, I know a few doctors, believe it or not, and just not just because I'm a terrible hypochondriac, but I know a few doctors, and I know quite a few folklorists, but I don't know many that cross the border into those two worlds, but you do. Can you tell those that have joined us here tonight how that came about? How someone like you, who obviously had a bit of a scientific mind, uh, a, a mind for um, you know medical things and stuff, stuff like that, became so interested in myths and legends. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I've had a lifelong fascination in the supernatural and in fairy tales. I mean, I was obsessed with ghost stories and horror as a child. Yeah, I had a well-thumbed copy of the Usborne Book of Ghosts that came home every week from the school library. And I remember my dad, that's the one, and I remember my dad used to record the old sort of black and white universal uh, horrors for me on video when I was little. So that fascination has always been there. But as you say, I mean, I trained as a doctor, so, so I work as a consultant paediatric pathologist and as a medical examiner for the NHS. And so they're quite different disciplines. Um, so a few years ago, I, I started to collect Welsh antiquarian books, more, more so as a hobby rather than anything else. But from there grew this database uh, of Welsh ghost accounts. Um, and that hobby eventually led to a slight change in career and actually trying to make folklore research a viable job that's viable in inverted commas there um which I guess was fueled by well at least in part by where I live and, and who I live with so I'm in Pontypridd in one of the roundhouse cottages that was commissioned by the 19th century archdruid and surgeon Dr William Price and sort of 
leaky roof and single glazing aside, it's quite a magical place to be. I mean, we have the woods behind us where Price tried to build that sort of ill-fated museum of Welsh culture, which still has the quarry and the workman's huts and one of Price's alleged altars and, and tame robins. Um, and then I get to share that space with my husband, Elidir, who also collects Welsh folklore and ghost stories for the books that he writes. So, um, and I guess important as well, I, I mean, I also lost one of my closest friends during the pandemic who was as equally obsessed with folklore and the supernatural as I am. Um, and if, you know, if there's anything that gets you to reevaluate your priorities, it, it's grief and loss, isn't it? So I made the decision at that point to go for it properly. I, I applied for a master's, then I applied for an honorary research fellow post in Museum Wales and found myself signing a book contract and it sort of really snowballed from there. That's incredible. So living where you live, surrounded by that atmosphere, by that place, do you think that there's some influence has seeped into you from that when you think of um, what Price used to do in that area? And um, uh, was it some, were you drawn to the area before you came there? Was it some, Were you looking for that sort of place? I know you lived in Cardiff for a while, but um, was it somewhere you were really looking to settle? I did. We'd been looking to um, move for quite a long time, but... By the time this house came on the market, we'd, we'd more or less given up and we'd sort of thought at that point, we're better off staying in Cardiff where we are and renovating the house that we already have. And then suddenly this place popped up on right move after we definitely decided we definitely weren't moving. And I think both of us instantly fell in love with the place at, at that point we actually didn't know that it was one of the roundhouse cottages because of the way it, it had been advertised so there was no mention of that at all um so when we turned up to the address and saw where where it actually was i mean that was that was the decision made for us um and even then when we moved in i mean the woods that we now own at the back were completely sort of grown over. You couldn't access them at all. So all of that history was I mean, completely sort of lost really, apart from the people who'd grown up on the street. They knew, they obviously know exactly what was here, but for for sort of um, everybody else, I mean, it was just gone. It was grown over that, that part of history had gone. So it it's definitely influenced um, I think the way that I work and the choices that I've made since moving here, certainly. And my grandfather's from this area. He was um, brought up in Kamer down the road. So, I mean, there is that family tie there as well and, and from Lantry Sant. So. That's great. And you started picking up and, list and looking and reading lots of old sort of folkloric books and tomes and things like that. When you really got into the nitty gritty of the um, of the ghost stories, of the legends, of these accounts, which are published for the first time in English in this book, for the most part. I mean, you've got a lot of Welsh language accounts there, which are so atmospheric when you read them. What was the biggest thing that, that jumped up to you? What, what was the biggest thing you learned about Welsh ghost stories, do you think? Oh, um, so I guess the research... I started doing last year uncovered some pretty interesting findings so it was it was almost separate to the book but then tied in quite nicely with it um, and the most interesting thing that I, I probably picked up there was the fact that the stereotypical figure of that ghost in the white sheet that's universally recognized absolutely everywhere across the world doesn't actually exist in Wales in any significant form, at least up until sort of the late 20th century. And, and actually neither do ghosts um, dressed in white or white ghosts in general, apart from that sort of laddie when the white lady motif, um, uh, spirits in sort of white clothing is, is much more closely associated with fairy lore. Um, the first account I actually found of a ghost in a white sheet um, that wasn't described as either a demonic or an angelic entity or a fairy figure it was actually the fighting ghost of Tondir, um, and that was only recorded in 1904. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of your listeners who don't know, this was a 
cadaverous figure, I suppose, which appeared in the Anisaldre colliery, which at the time had fallen out of use. Um, but even so, it was only described as being shrouded in white in one newspaper report from that time. The other reports don't mention its clothing at all. And actually, they say that it looked more like a normal person in, in every regard, except for the fact that it had these black pits for eyes. Um, so it's most certainly an example of, of pranking. It's just a pretty violent example, given that it apparently tried to strangle someone. Um, and it's probably not a coincidence that that figure appeared when it did, given that it was 1904 and it was the year of the largest religious revival in Wales within the 20th century. So it was a huge volume of ghostly visions that were described during this time, uh, a lot of which mirrored sort of earlier ghosts that had been described during the 17th and 18th century. So it all, it all um, ties in with each other. Absolutely, it does. And what I will say, Beth, uh, Bethan, God, I was thinking of Bethan because <laughs> Bethan Briggs Miller, her favourite story when she came to the fire pit for me was the Tondi Spectre. So that's why we were talking that's about it. So, um, yeah, I've got to get myself out of there. So I, I was just thinking of Bethan there for a second, <laughs> Delith. Um, I believe that what you really, truly have done with this book is given the Welsh ghost a voice. Now, in a lot of these stories, as we well know, the ghost does not speak until someone speaks to itself. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that you are going to open the mouths of many ghosts all over Wales because all of a sudden they now have a voice appearing in this volume. And that is my next question, really, from someone I, I read lots of ghost stories all over the UK and never realised that identity that the Welsh ghost had. What do you think the biggest difference is between a Welsh ghost and a ghost maybe from Scotland, from England, from Ireland, and the way the tales are written? It's only now I realise that there is a huge difference. And now, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's actually a lot to be said about how different Welsh ghost lore is compared to the rest of Britain. Mm -hmm. I and mean, there are obvious universal similarities. For example, one of the most common motifs reported in England historically was always the the ghost of the living, like the classic wraith. And this is this is quite similar in Wales. I mean, there are countless examples of seeing the spirit of a person you know is definitely alive and kicking at that point. Mm. Um, and then there's that motif of the ghost with unfinished business coming down to relay their message. So it's mm. pretty universally recognised stuff. Um, but then in Wales, we've got this sort of weird set of motifs that appear right back in the earliest uh, 17th and 18th century accounts and they they've actually persisted right up until the present day um, so as, as an example we're absolutely obsessed with phantom animals in Wales mm. much more so than the rest of Britain um, the SPR reports show an extremely small number of ghostly animals being reported across Britain. But in Wales, it's one of our most commonly reported phenomena. And actually, from my own database anecdotally, which goes back to the sort of um, 16th, 17th century accounts right up to the present day, it, it represents about a quarter of all those cases. Um, and they're especially common the earlier back you go. Um, and also, it's not just those sort of usual suspects like the black dogs that we see across the, re the rest of Britain. Um, we've got some really, I guess, unusual choices for phantom beasts here. So there's dancing spectral pigs in Gwent. Mm. There's demonic goslings in Glamorganshire. There's there's an angry ghost turkey in Brecon. Uh, there's not one, but but two ghost donkeys in Llanwyna. Uh, there's ghost sheep in Llanegrin and there's a giant ghost cat in Penmaen Mawr and in Anglesey. So, I mean, you name it, we've got it. Um, and we also, in terms of these sort of unique motifs, we've also got these very abstract apparitions. So things like floating symmetrical objects like spheres and pyramids, uh, humanoid figures, but with missing limbs. Uh, balls and wheels of fire are an extreme. I love the wheel of fire. Love oh, the wheel of fire. You can't beat a wheel of fire. Uh, and things like ghostly weather phenomena, you know, mo mo motifs that are 
first identified really in the 17th and the 18th centuries by the likes of Edmund Jones, but then have actually endured right into contemporary ghost law, even despite the influence of popular culture. So we've still got those wheels of fire appearing today in Wales, which is quite incredible. It is. And um, it's nice to hear you um, talking about Edmund Jones there, the he and Brofwood. You know, it's, I'm also a very big fan of um, the work that he did all those years ago. And it's amazing when you look at, it's the first time I've come across, you've got white dogs that actually help people as well. And sort of, um, rather than being these foreboding death omens that are often associated with, with these creatures, you've got helpful spirit animals, which seem quite common in Wales as well, which you, you covered a lot. And the book itself is broken up into a number of chapters. I mean, you've got Unfinished Business. There's a classic Welsh ghost story where the ghost will often ask someone to to find a hidden treasure, to do a task that they um, that have left undone when, they, when, they, when they've died. Seems very common in Wales. You've got spectral beasts, holy ghosts, poltergeists, the laddie wen, water spirits, fantastical ghouls, and then death omens. So much stuff in this book, Delith. You must be incredibly proud of it. I genuinely feel that if anyone wants a book on the supernatural in Wales, this is it. I was recently away and I sat down and I started reading it and there was so much in here that was so old, but yet so fresh. And that is <laughs> such a gift to the, um, the supernatural world. In these stories... I would probably say that 90% of them I had never come across before in my life. You must have done some real digging when it came to this. Well, to be honest, most of it comes from my own library here. So it comes from the books that I've collected over the years. I would say the only difference is that compared to other books on ghosts in Wales that have come before, rather than looking at the same sources instead we've gone for those welsh language accounts so mm. the books that have previously been overlooked i mean parish history accounts are, are a fantastic source of regional folklore as well as ghost law um but they're they're often overlooked or ignored because they're in welsh so they're not potentially as accessible to to those authors who are writing in english um, so hopefully, I really hope this book sort of opens up that extra sort of part of Welsh culture and part of Welsh history that, that people can then dig deeper into. That I mean, the parish history accounts are absolutely fantastic and they're, they're, more, they're more or less always written by people who are local to that area. So they're generally speaking clergymen and, and scholars who have written them. So they have an in-depth knowledge of of local sort of belief systems but i mean they're a wealth of information and it's a shame that more hasn't been made of them previously i think i also think what you've done here is a lot of ghost stories as you well know are set in old manor houses crumbling manor houses or on bleak mountain tops or um this type of thing whereas the vast majority of these stories are happening to working people in 18th and 17th and 18th century Wales. Perhaps the person hasn't recorded it themselves, and a clergyman or a travelling scholar has picked up the tale, but this is very much working-class supernatural happenings, aren't they? In the darkest, deepest valleys of Wales, and often in North Wales as well, which sometimes doesn't get... Um, the voice that it should have had. And many of these places I find, places I I barely heard of, little villages in the back of beyond, which are beautiful places. And to hear their stories told again is incredible. And um, so much character to them. And um, yeah, amazing. I'd love to... Um, I'd love to have a look around your library one day because it must be just full of these books. <laughs> where, where do you get most of them? Oh, I mean... I've, I, I think I've reached that point now where I've collected so many over the years that I, I actually have shops that contact me directly now and say, we've had such and such in, do you want it? So in that respect, I'm, I'm quite lucky. But for the most part, they come from auction houses, eBay. Um, you know, the internet is, is a fantastic way of finding these books. Unfortunately, it does mean that the prices of a lot of them have shot up recently 
But I mean, I still end up buying titles for, you know, a pound or two and finding that they've got the author's original inscriptions inside the book. I mean, it's they're just because they're Welsh language and again, people aren't as interested in them. Um, so yeah, it's it's years worth of collecting, but I knew they'd come in useful one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was your um, the most enjoyable chapter for you to write, do you think? Which is the one you enjoyed the most? I know it's a horrible thing to ask, but what, what do you think uh, sort of uh, really got you interested in? Oh, I, a chapter that I didn't think that I would enjoy writing that much, but ended up really, really enjoying was the Water Spirits chapter, funnily enough. Um, that was That was a chapter which at the beginning of the process, I don't, think we were 100% on board as to whether it would actually stay in the book or not but I'm so glad that it has I mean we've really done a deep dive on um the sort of it's not it's not really a ghost but it's more cryptozoological but but the avanc mm. um looking into the history of of where that has come from and actually even the history of the word itself so it really was a deep dive. I even contacted, um, well, actually, he's a, he's, uh, they're a friend of mine um, who have an interest in um, in sort of animals through the medieval period, who I actually contacted to discuss the state of the beaver in Wales within the medieval period. So it's, um, yeah, there was a lot of work that went into that. And actually, I, that's one of my favourite chapters now. And, and as well, finding that the Avanc hasn't just stayed as that sort of beast in thinner Avanc, but that actually contemporary sources are now calling it something quite different. So the ghost um, that is said to appear in um, the rectory in Frosilli that sort of drags itself in from the sea at night and into the house, and the one that in the corridor will ask whoever happens to be a passing won't you turn around and look at me has actually been described as an avanc within contemporary texts today which was new to me but it's brilliant mm. to see the that evolution in the folklore and to see it sort of being being used in a different way yeah very much so and let's not forget that um you you co-wrote this book with mark norman who is um, the host of the the folklore podcast that many listeners here will be uh very familiar with i'm sure now mark is from the devon area he's, he's an expert in in the black dog and um, the folklore that comes with that so it must have been interesting to have that other voice as well that other voice from a person who not living in the area um not you know who isn't that familiar with Wales to be speaking about and hearing these stories for the first time as well and that leads me on to throughout the autumn I'm very very lucky Delith that you've asked me to come along and we're going to be doing a number of launches for this book in a number of locations excellent locations as well really atmospheric places throughout the autumn starting in Pontypridd which is um, your your home now, and some great ghost stories in Pontypridd as well. And anyone listening to this before the 30th of September, Storyville Books are hosting a uh, a launch in the town of Pontypridd, and tickets are available there. Delith, Mark, and myself will all be there to tell stories from the book and uh, to have a real deep dive into what is in this fantastic tome. There are loads of stories in here, Delith. There are loads of subjects. There are loads of really, really creepy tales that I've not heard for a long time, if ever. You must have a favourite and one that you'd like to hear at the fire pit at the heart of the forest. Which one is that? Oh, I would love you to tell my absolute favourite Welsh ghost story. Um, it includes a uniquely Welsh motif. So we were talking about unique motifs earlier. This is a classic Welsh motif of a ghost howling into the night. Which is long as the day and long as the night and long as the wait for. And then you insert your name there. Um, and then that person comes along, receives that ghost's message and the ghost can finally rest in peace. But this particular story has got a slight twist in the tale 
because the name of that long-awaited person uh, carries its own significance with regards to Welsh mythology. And it's a really creepy story to boot. So what's not to love? Absolutely, yeah. Before I let you go, and before I sit back and tell you that tale, and tell everyone who's come to listen to you, have you ever seen a ghost, Stella? Have you ever had a ghostly experience? I've had several weird experiences, to be honest. And given that I'm a scientist, I'm not sure it's accurate to say that they can't be explained. But I grew up in a house where you could follow the smell of pipe tobacco from room to room. And you would occasionally find the odd item being thrown across the room at you. Uh, One of my favourite experiences was when I was very young, uh, going for a walk with my family and finding a gap in the hedge marked by a stile along a road we used to walk all the time. And when we followed that footpath, we found ourselves in some sort of glade next to a spring with flowers everywhere. I, I can remember it really, really vividly. And we eventually followed the footpath and came out not far from when we'd actually gone in the first instance. But a couple of days later, my parents asked where we'd like to go for a walk again. And I mentioned that place and no one in my family could remember having been there. We even walked along that road multiple times trying to find that gap in the hedge. There was nothing there. Now, it's probably all the misrememberings of a child but there's something so extraordinarily Arthur Machen and Strange Roads about that story that I'm really fond of that particular memory. That's a great, great story. <laughs> <laughs> the Folklore of Wales Ghosts by Delif Bader and Mark Norman is available at the end of this month from all good bookshops. We'd love it if you would order from Storyville Books in pont or from the uh, uh, from Mark's site as well, which is, Delith, which one is that? The... Um, uh, the Folklore, Folklore Podcast. Podcast, exactly. But also anywhere you get your books, you can get this book. My friends, I would thoroughly recommend it. If you want a deep dive into the supernatural history of Wales, there is no better place to start than here. Diolch fawr, Delith, for coming here tonight, for sitting with me and just talking about our um, shared love of ghosts, if you like. Congratulations on the book. It's a fantastic read. Now just sit back, relax, as I tell your tale. And hopefully, everyone who hears it will get to sleep tonight. Thank you. Long ago, on a cliff top overlooking Rossilli Bay, there was an old stone house, as white as snow with a thatched roof that let in as much water as it kept out. It had been empty for many years, for the local people said that it was haunted. Spirits walked nearby, and fairy lights were seen under the moon. But for one family who needed a home, all this they tried to forget about as they moved in to the cottage above the bay. Marie was the lady's name. Her husband Lloyd was a fisherman and would spend all day out in the bay fishing and bringing back his catch so they could sell it in local markets. She started to make that old shack a home, painting, hanging pictures, building furniture. They grew a small family, two young children, and slowly it became a happy place. The last room that she wanted to make was a spare bedroom, one where family from afar could visit and stay in comfort. She furnished it with a bed and a dresser, and it looked beautiful. She stood in the doorway one day, looking out to see the wind blowing in her hair and wondering how things had been so wonderful, how happiness had found her at last. And although they were still poor, they had what they always wanted, a feast of a house, a wonderful place overlooking the sea. But the night after the last room was furnished, 
things started to change. One of the children was excited and wanted to stay in there for the night. But come midnight, when the faraway church bells were heard ringing, the child left the room, saying it was unpleasant, and that noise was heard inside. The next night, Marie went inside. A small candle was burning, and she sat on the bed. The place was so quiet it felt like a grave. But although she could hear the family in the other part of the house eating their tea, it's what she heard next that truly chilled her. She felt a presence behind her ear, and then a voice spoke in a voice as old as the mountains and as capricious as the sea. Hear your teeth. I hear your nose. I hear when arrows am around. <gasps> Marie felt the hair around the back of her neck stand up as she spun around to find there was nothing there. She ran out and closed the wooden door. And then she heard banging inside. A husband came running. What's going on? I don't know. But listen. It felt like furniture was being scraped along the floor. It felt like something was hammering on the window. And then the voice came again. Hear your teeth. I hear your nose. I hear twin arrows am around. Long is the day and long is the night. And long I've been waiting for around. Yes, that's what it said. The family moved to the other side of the house and waited for dawn to break the time between times, the time when it was neither night nor day, but the sun had gone and the sky was grey and returned and only then brave enough to open the door to the house, to the room, and nothing had moved. From that night on, every night it happened. Scraping, moving, banging, as if something wanted to get out of the room, as if the furniture was being tossed across and smashed. But when they opened the door in the morning, everything was fine. They placed a bolt on the door, fearing that whatever was within would like to escape. But nothing came. Days turned to weeks, weeks turned to months, months turned to years, and every night they would hear it. They considered moving away. They had the local vicar come in, but he was afeard to go near the room. But then one night, everything changed. It was a day like any other. Marie stood outside the house looking at the bay. A husband had just come back from fishing a good catch she saw a small rowing boat making its way over the waves as if it had passed from the next bay. She watched with interest as it pulled up onto the beach and a man climbed out leaving the boat there on the sand. He wore a hood and his face could barely be seen and carried with him a bag and he made his way up the winding path towards the cottage before he stood in front of Marie. I have travelled far. Could I stay here tonight? I have food. I have bread. I have fish. I have water and a little wine. But I have nowhere to let you stay. The man came inside and sat at their table. Both Lloyd and Marie fed him, watched him drink. He said very little. He had a strange countenance about him. Eyes that seemed to stare at the wall. A grey pallor on his face and his hair was long and dark. But he was kind enough. I see you have a room at the back. Could I stay in there? I have travelled far and have nowhere else to go. We do not allow people to stay there, said Marie. There is something in that room. Something from somewhere else. And I would not wish you to stay. 
Things like that don't bother me. Please, let me stay there. Marie led the man to the bedroom door, pulled back the bolt, and he walked inside, placing his his bag on the bed. Um, I wish you the best of nights, and please stay for breakfast in the morning. What is your name? Thank you for your kindness. My name is... My name is Aron. When he said the name, a chill ran right down the spine of Mary's back, and she closed the door and stood there for a moment before hurrying to her own room. That night was the quietest they had ever spent at the house. Far away they could hear a dog barking, the church bells ringing and the wind just blowing in the rooftop but nothing else. The words that came from the room seemed to echo in our mind, but there, and only there, were they heard. Hear your teeth, a hear your nos, a hear twin aros am aran. Long is the day and long is the night, and long I wait for aran. Marie lay in her bed, thinking what could it possibly mean, until before she knew it, the cock started to crow, the sun started to rise, and she sat up. Of the visitor there was no sign on the dining room table. She made her way to the old wooden door and knocked, but there was no answer. Hello? Hello? Nothing still. She pulled back the bolt and peered inside. The room was empty. The furniture was exactly as it had been. But on the bed, there was a single red rose. Marie came in, picked up the rose, and looked around. Of the visitor, there was no sign at all. She told her husband and showed him the rose. He went and peered in himself and then looked out of the window at the boat down in the bay and it was still there, waiting for the tide to come in. The visitor was never seen again. The voice was never heard again. Marie and Lloyd grew old and died in the cottage many years later, and their children lived there. And nothing ever happened again. But the story is still told, going from year to year. And today, I tell it to you. Hear you deeth, a hear you nos, a hear do in aros am aroun. Story chosen by Dr. Delith Bader for me to tell you here at the fire pit of the heart of the forest at the time between times. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Delith for joining me here. The link where you can buy Delith's book will be in the show notes at Storyville Books at pont Please, it is a fantastic read and something that promotes the ghosts of Wales for us all to enjoy. I will see you soon at the time between times and until then, no star.